panel is uh, called On Dramaturgy and Leadership. And I'm just going to speak for a few moments about uh, where the, the genesis or where the, the inspiration came from for the, um, for the panel. And then I'll, I'll introduce the panelists. We'll have a brief discussion followed by a little bit of QA. We've got about an hour for the discussion, so we're going to make it light and lively. Uh, I wanted to begin the conference, this conference day with a discussion that's actually pretty close to my heart. Um, for the past few years, I've been experiencing uh, and getting opportunities for more and more leadership roles, and I realized very quickly that I was actively using a lot of my dramaturgical skills and qualities um, in, in that work. And particularly, I'm talking about the, the act of listening carefully, of analyzing information, synthesizing information, and then articulating direction and interpretation to a group that allowed us to move forward. And I went, that's dramaturgical, and it also turned out to be leadership. So what, what I, I started to claim it as both, um, to the point where uh, the way of talking about the impact of what I do as a dramaturg helped lead me to become executive director of Alberta Theatre Projects, which is a job I took up in November. Um, and and I, was, I was up against folks who had uh, MBAs, uh, who had run companies for years, and it was the way that I spoke about uh, about leadership and the way I spoke about how I, I was interested in leading the team in the organization, which was dramaturgical, that was really appealing to the board chairs and the, the people on the search committee. And I really appreciated that that was part of how I was speaking about that and that was part of what appealed to people. So I wanted to have that discussion here um, because I really started to recognize the power of what we do as leadership uh, and the leadership impact we can have I'm not sure whether we've properly explored it or claimed it necessarily that way, and so I wanted to have this conversation today. One of the interesting tensions I discovered too in it is uh, a lot of times the way we speak about what we do as dramaturgs is that it's as a support function. It's a support function, we're supporting. And there's sometimes a tension between thinking about supporting and thinking about leading. Uh, but they actually have a lot more in common than I think we think. So that was, those are some of the things that occurred to me, and I'm really excited to speak today um, with these wonderful folks that are with me. Now, all, you'll be able to read all their bios in great detail in your packages. So I'm just going to speak a little bit, uh, hit some of the high points. Um, we have Alana Brownstein, and Alana teaches at Boston University here, and is also the dramaturg at Company One. Director, yeah, director of new work. A lot director of, of new work. work. Yes, director of new work, and there's a, a whole, a whole um, roster of dramaturgs at Company One as well. And next to her is Ed Sobel, who recently took up uh, the head of playwriting at uh, Temple University. And next to me is Mark Bly, a, a, a leader in our field with over 35 years experience um, and a lot of significant work both within universities and colleges and also um, at regional theaters and, uh, and on Broadway as well. And also an alumni leader of LMDA as well. So welcome to Alana, Ed, and Mark. Thing. 
that I use to help on my own. Um, and and uh, we're being live streamed, right? On yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so I know there's a lot of um, impressionable kids um, watching how at this point. So, uh, so I won't name the thing that I, um, that I was using that. Um, but we have a room full of ground jokes, and I'm sure you're all great at, at, at reading subset, I mean, subtext. Um, and, and so you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, so I, I, I'm using about those two things, and then I start um, putting them together in, in my head. So, yeah, naturally. naturally. So, so, um, so I came up with, it's, it's a short plane ride, so I only have 12 things. But um, <laughs> the, 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 so 12, and I, I also don't claim to be an expert on either of these things. Um, so, uh, so it's just, um, points of convergence, not advice, just points of convergence between leadership and the other thing that I spent time thinking about. So, uh, so here they are. I, I dropped them down. So, uh, so first of all is that if you're doing it alone, um, it's an entirely different activity. <laughs> so, so you need the, the, the willing participation of other people to do it. Selfish uh, about it. Um, eventually, people won't want to do it with you. <laughs> uh, for this next one, I actually owe a debt to Morgan Jess, um, who um, ten years ago, I think, in Philadelphia, right, um, uh, on a similar topic, um, talked about leadership as in leading like a shepherd. Um, and so, uh, so I thought, well, you, you, you know, you can do it. Uh, from, on, from on top, but there are a lot of other positions um, from which you can do it, and um, it's particularly rewarding sometimes to do it from behind. So, uh, another observation, uh, I think, you know, almost everyone thinks that they are better at it than they actually are. <laughs> Skills. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that contribute to leadership. Sure. 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 
subjects is naturally aligned with leadership. In fact, I think most of us are. So, um, in my own practice, I am particularly interested in how, much like what you were talking about in terms of shepherding, right? How to lead by making space for other people, right? How to lead by creating um, provocative questions that don't have predisposed endings, right? So if you're if, if you're trying to lead people towards a predetermined goal, um, it can be like herding cats. But if through the act of leadership you can behave as you would with a text or with your collaborators, which is what can be discovered together, right? Like that's a way more fruitful path <laughs> than trying to push everybody towards the goal that, that you think is the right choice. Whereas you don't even, I mean, I find uh, when I'm in leadership positions, I don't know where we're going to go. I'm more interested in figuring out, um, you know, what's that journey about. And I think um, one of the other qualities of, I think, really good growing is the, uh, the fearlessness of speaking truth to power. Um, doing it generously, right? Not, not combatively. But, um, and I think speaking truth to power has to be at the center point of any uh, model of leadership. We have to be able to ask the questions that are a little bit dangerous, that maybe take us in a new direction we weren't expecting, that maybe provide an opportunity for leaving behind um, comfort and other models that have worked in the past um, towards the unknown. And those are things that um, serve us in the rehearsal hall as well as in uh, institutional leadership and public advocacy. theater, 
I think I deserve a raise because three of those six ideas are mine. So that's inspiration. <laughs> Two, the great leaders I've seen make their staff members feel like heroes periodically. Make them feel like heroes when it's appropriate. Really critical. Not just the actors on the stage. That's easy. Listening, really important. Listen hard. Two, synthesizing, really important. Analytical synthesizing. By the way, Ed said this. There's an article that Vicki uh, has written that's going to be in, in, in a Mazda's extraordinary book. Don't forget to read this. It's fantastic for an article. Uh, communication, again, is something that she talks about, which is really, really important. Being able, this is our gift, for God's sakes. And it doesn't just take the form of articles, talking, sometimes, Tim Blake Nelson, I worked with him at Seattle Rep. Sometimes I wouldn't say anything in a rehearsal. And Tim would just on a break take me aside and say, Bly, you haven't said anything all rehearsal. You're like a neutron star. What the hell is wrong? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say, this is what's wrong. And so communication that way is also equally powerful. A sense of history. A sense of short history and deep history, perspective we can bring. And last, putting oneself in a position of vulnerability. Again, you talk about this when I read your article. Oh my God, this is huge accountability. Can't tell you how many times I've been nearly fired or asked to leave to different places. In the 80s, uh, I remember at the Guthrie Theater, uh, at some conference, I don't know when, uh, I brought this notion up in, uh, of the idea of the man who shot Liberty Valley Syndrome. As dramaturgs, uh, I, I think I brought it up in the context of feeling sorry for myself, or our feeling sorry for ourselves. I don't know how many of you know the movie, this great John Ford movie, classic. Uh, Jane Stewart, John Wayne, uh, about a lawyer from the East, goes to this Southwest town, tries to bring law and order, and is laughed at. Because Liberty Valance and his gang says, oh, get the hell out of here, Easterner. And John Wayne, of course, is the only one who can stop it. But in the end, don't want to spoil too much for you, has to stop him in the shadow. Just like a dramaturg sometimes does. And at the time, I thought, and, and James Stewart, in the end, ends up going on, he faces him down. In the end, James Stewart ends up becoming the senator, and John Wayne, who kills Liberty Valance from the shadows, ends up a drunken cowboy and a nobody. That was how I felt sometimes as a dramaturg. A man in the shadows, a person in the shadows. And I've come a long way since then. I've said, you know, no, 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 no. Stop that, stop that. How about the other version of that that's the person who stood in the street and stood up to Liberty Valance and said, I shall be the person of accountability and stand on the street take the shot and go forward in the future. Be the one to the power. And I think that's leadership. So. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, and it's interesting because Mark, you brought up a few, a few of the opportunities, like the, the increasingly when we look at what dramaturgs, what kind of accountability or leadership role dramaturgs are taking up. Um, Artistic directorship is one that, that seems like it makes a, a lot of sense and more people are, are finding their way to it. And I'm curious about, because one of the things that I was interested in too, and, and the, the article has an interview with a, a gentleman named Ben Henderson who is a, who's a, a city councilor of the city of Edmonton. 
Um, and he, he's a dramaturg, and he, I wanted to find out from him, you know, what, what are the qualities that go to your political career that are dramaturgical? And, and I'm interested in, you know, there's the opportunities like artistic director, but are there, are there other opportunities that we see, or, or new opportunities that we see that we don't, I feel like dramaturgs could provide some impact and leadership there, and, and how might we do that, and what should we be, what should we be looking for, what should we be going, what, what should we be going after, other than whatever we'd like. Um, Okay, Yvonne. <laughs> yeah, spectacular. Okay, so um, one of the things that I think maybe um, in the past dramaturgs felt was maybe isolation or maybe um, disempowerment. And we don't have time for that anymore. N nor do we have uh, the requirement that we have to be alone in a room or in a library doing research. Um, or waiting for somebody to invite us into a conversation. I am so passionate about um, LMDA's uh, initiative over the last many years of the concept of dramaturg-driven, right? That is, how do you make the work that excites you? How do you make space for other artists whose work you love to get together? How do you curate, yeah? And so you can do that physically, right? You can find money and rent a space and you know get people together or whatever. Or you can do it online. <laughs> and really the brilliance of the emergence of social media is that it provides us a way to be really vocal and powerful leaders as dramaturgs in the American theater. Um, Twitter is amazing. Uh, you know, I talk a lot, generally. Uh, I talked a lot to people when I was in physical proximity to them. Now I can talk a lot on Twitter to people who I otherwise wouldn't be in conversation with, right? Like, for example, I feel like I always read Peter Mertz's reviews in the Washington Post, and I liked him. I thought he was an interesting guy. I felt like I could kind of get a sense of like what he was caring about in the scene in DC. But now I can talk to him on Twitter, and we can have a conversation about work, right? We can talk about plays that have been performed there that maybe are going to be performed in, in Boston. I can get deeper into a conversation with him than I would ever have the chance to do. What am I going to do? Like, you know, fly to DC and knock on his door? No. But Twitter gives us a chance, not just Twitter, lots of media, social media, give us a chance to be a voice in the field, to stand up for what we believe in. And more importantly to me is to be a voice for inclusion, diversity, parity. If these are things that matter to you, what matters to you, right? Those are the things that matter to me. But what matters to you? What are you passionate about aesthetically, socially, politically, in your art and in your work and in your life? You can actually have a platform to be a leader on those issues simply by opting in. And it's one of the things that I try and work with my students on, which is um, developing some fearlessness about being a leader on stuff you care about. You don't have to be a leader of an institution in order to have impact. You can be an independent human being who has impact with another group of human beings, whether in proximity or not, right? Because suddenly we have a way to democratize that involvement and the voice of the artist. You no longer have to wait for somebody to give you the entry point. You can take that step yourself. And to me, that is the most exciting development in American theater of the last 10 years. If you simply look at what TCG has done, right? So they went from, I think, being an, an organization that was largely seen as sort of um, gatekeepery, right? Like for large institutions only. Um, through their development of their, uh, their blog series and the TCG salons, they, there is some incredible conversation happening there that I, I don't know where that would have happened otherwise, right? And because it's through TCG, it gives it some, uh, some legitimacy that it might not otherwise have had. And it's giving a chance for independent artists who maybe don't have institutional affiliations to have a voice in the things that matter to them. And to me, like that's huge. And if we as dramaturgs can do better at advocating for ourselves, what we care about, and for our role in those uh, the way of making work that matters to us, there's no stopping it.
project um, and, and attempt to solve that need, that by its nature, you're, you're acting in a leadership capacity. Um, and uh, I know just with the, you know, the work that I've done either with my with Step Mulk or with the Arden or now at, at Temple, um, it's been about saying, here's something Well, I think I think uh, I think this is there's an interesting thing that's been raised uh, by both Ted and, and Pilato. These things, if even in the space of five years, and a lot of particularly has touched upon something, and in, in no way is this a, a, a criticism. Is it ever back to okay without the mic? Because it is a bit frustrating, this mic sometimes. I would suggest that the people on the live stream probably can't hear without the mic. <laughs> I think I think if you stood up, though, you might be okay. All right, we'll try that. Um, one of the things we're gonna do, uh, I know that um, I'm done with my formal questions, um, and I wanted to make sure that we were able to open it up a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> another great thing about this mic. Um, uh, just to open it up, we've got about another half an hour, and, and I wanted to open up the discussion here, uh, to start that discussion. Uh, Bob, you have something? Uh, perhaps it just had to go along the line of what people are talking about in the nature of leadership in the theater today in our, in our context. I just want to second what Mark was saying about I remember these conferences of the early 90s, and the ancients among us may remember what those were like. What, where, where was a lot of whining, the subtext was about the lack of power Grammar Turks had within the, within the institutions and within the rehearsal room. And I think you're quite right, we won't take that anymore. And, uh, and the fact that this organization, for example, is flourishing, that it has a wide range of practitioners of different genres, of different generations, is testament to the fact that we have been able to, or the society, or theater makers in general, have been able to affect change in such a way that Empowered within the room, welcome within the room, and are generally considered by most certain people that I work with as being you know, a legitimate part of the process, and, and that is stuff that you're celebrating and, and is a change. And I want to give a very specific example of that, if I may, <coughs> uh, and around the leadership issue too. I've just finished working on a production of Alice Through the Looking Glass at the Stratford Festival, uh, uh, an adaptation by the late James Rainey of book. Uh, it was directed by Jillian Kiley, uh, <coughs> a Newfoundland, originally from Newfoundland, now based in Ottawa, designed by Greta Gorecki from Edmonton, uh, lighting designed by Kimberly Purtell, technical direction at the Avon Theatre in Stratford, which is a thousand seat house by Alyssa Horsecraft, uh, choreography by Dana Tekash, uh, associate designer Jennifer Goodman, um, and what commonality there, of course, is all of the power positions in the room are were women. <coughs> and there were a few guys who were privileged to be part of that. Room. He is the production director and Jonathan Monroe, 
post. And uh, what was remarkable to me was the nature of that collaboration, led by Jillian Kiley, who's an exceptional artist in her own right and has her own kind of view of how work is created. But because it was women who largely, on all levels, created this show, cast of 20, um, the dynamic and the spirit in the room was totally different from what you, one usually expenses, expense, uh, expense at the Stratford Festival, which, don't forget, is 61 years old. The production model is based pre-look back in anger. It comes from <laughs> an English model of repertory theater actor management. Yeah. So that you can imagine how alpha male <coughs> that organization is. And so to see this new way of approaching uh, the creation of a work through the eyes of some of the older actors in the production, where they used to be, you know, berated or whatever, bullied by English men. Um, <laughs> in this new context, again, for me, who's been around the block a few times, was truly liberating. And I think uh, reflective of what we're talking about. Leadership can be done in different ways. And we have, in the most progressive case, found ways to, uh, to enable <coughs> all of us to give our best work. Everybody who has made that happen and uh, the kind of leadership that you're talking about, I think now is the new normal. Thank God. Yes, Lisa. Um, hi, I uh, wanted to thank Ed for bringing up the, um, surprisingly, because it's 2014 and 1972, uh, issue of leadership and gender parity in the American theater. Um, I am kind of thrilled that it's going on. I'm very bored that it's going on because I work for a woman in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia has women uh, all over corporate America. The court, if you go to a corporate leadership conference, it's so feminine heavy. Um, you, you feel like you're in a different world. Um, I'm gonna single out Karen Robertson, who is a woman and is the head of the theater department at Kennesaw. There's a woman who's the artistic director of Theater Emory. Is that right, Janice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and when I venture out of Atlanta, so I feel like that's good, you know, 2014, a lot of women, it's really great. Um, I feel like when I venture out of Atlanta, I'm, I'm put in this very strange throwback to my childhood uh, when there weren't women in executive positions. Um, and I feel a lot of anger, and I feel a lot of conversations about this should be happening, um, which is reminiscent of the whining conversations that we used to have in the early 90s. And so what I, and, and I, I feel myself, like I don't really want to be part of all that. I moved to a city where um, I don't really have to work with a culture where there aren't a lot of women and that extends to the funding community, the corporate community, the arts leadership community, so many, um, the leadership of Atlanta. Uh, and I don't think we're a particularly progressive town, which is my point. Like Atlanta is not the progressive, it's not Portland, it's not Seattle, it's not Minneapolis. We're progressive enough, but this is not a pro the progressive center of America, and yet there are women all over the leadership positions. So my challenge and my question for LMDA is how can we move the gender parity conversation forward faster? Because American theater is not leading this conversation. We're behind, from my vantage point in Atlanta, we're behind the more progressive elements at Coca-Cola and Home Depot, which are not the most progressive corporate cultures in the United <laughs> States. But they uh, have found a way to allow women to thrive, really thrive, in executive leadership. So I throw out to us, and I wonder if the panel could address, how can the American theater jump forward? Because it feels like we're a little, we're a little stuck, and there's a, a place for uh, dramaturgs to, to lead this, but I'm not really sure what the strategy is. So the, the question uh, the question is how how can LMDA or how can how can dramaturgs um, really uh, allow for um, the conversation about gender parity to, to take a leadership forward and how do we lead that? Does anyone want to talk a bit about that? Anyone got an answer to that? <laughs> you go on. Oh God. Uh, okay, I don't have any answers, Lisa. I'm sorry. Um, what I will say. About are not progressive. 
aggressive as a field. And that's a real problem. And I think sometimes we get a little like comfortable when we make small advances, right? And yet, the entire conversation with the Kilroys, with Parity Ray, with this notion of like, you know, the pipeline, it is incredibly frustrating to still have this conversation in 2014, and yet also incredibly necessary. And I think one of the things that we as dramaturgs can do is not let our exhaustion with the topic discourage us from being uh, forceful about it, right? This gets back to that notion of speaking truth to power. What are you doing in your institutions and with emerging artists to make space? Um, I will say that at Company One, we have an, uh, we're a collective, so we operate as a collective staff, and we are also highly dramaturgical. And one of the things that I've become, I, I realized the other day that I've never worked for a woman. I just never have. I've always, and I've worked for amazing men. I've worked for, I've had amazing, amazing mentors, but I've never worked for a woman. And right now I have a staff of incredible young women as dramaturgs with me at Company One, and one of my goals is to find spaces to allow them to be leaders, because that's how we're gonna change it. I think in some ways, uh, time will do some stuff that we haven't been able to do, because more and more young women are coming up with the expectation that they too should have a voice. So uh, I think numbers are in our favor in some ways. <coughs>
function to draw the curtain. Became directors of something or producers of something. Those are the people who ultimately end up being Dickens' artistic directors. Those are the ones who get taken seriously. That's what happens. We have to, we have to understand that. And second, I think it fundamentally starts, and again, this is the gestation process, it's the evolutionary process. It starts, Christian Parker recently said this to a former student of mine, it starts in the training ground. We have to start there, in those institutions, in the colleges. We have to start training people to think that women should be producers, should be artistic directors. Thinking that way at that point, not just you should grow up to be a literary man, you should grow up to be a dramatist, you should grow up to be an artistic director. That's where you start, and the classes you should be taking should be thinking in that direction. Totally. That's the curriculum, that's the format, that's the structure. And not just tiny little classes about dramatic literature or post structuralism, but a much broader base. That's what it should be. This? Um, yeah, I'm going to go back to uh, Ed on the plane, so I know the next event. Um, <laughs> 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 Can you stand up? So I can, oh, sorry. Um, I was just saying, I'm sorry I wasn't next to Ed on the plane, but just when you were, when you were saying, let's not just talk about it, because we're better be, you know, to do it. Let's, let's not talk. I think in just terms of your questions, Lisa, yes, you know, the conversation gets frustrating and exhausting, but so we can talk about it. But I feel like what we can do, each of us can do something about it, not having to talk about it, but having the, your dramaturg posse all being women by choosing who we work with at our at our level and relationally, we're making that change. So then when Bob goes into his rehearsal, that's going to be the room. Um, that's how it, that's how it happens. I, I think about being in Texas, living in Austin. You say like being in Texas, you're like, oh, there are no women in power. The rest of Texas, but I don't feel like I'm in Texas. I'm in Austin where people are making things, where they're doing it. Doing it where they are. Um, so if you, if you look at this where you are and what you can reach out to and how you can can match your making the change, you don't have to feel like, oh, but I live in a big red state or I live in a place where no women are in power. Can I, I just want to add one thing to that, Liz, which is that I think it's really important that every single person in this room, regardless of whether you are a dramaturg on your second day ever or you are like you've been doing it for a million years, every person in this room has the potential for leadership. You simply have to choose to. Right? Yeah. Especially those of you who may be very early career and you're nervous or you think like, what do I have to add? You have your own innate experience that is different from anyone else's. You absolutely have something to add to the equation. You simply have to be brave enough to take the risk to do it because it's not always gonna work out, but you have to be brave enough. Yeah, and, and uh, I, see, I see Sydney and also you. Um, the other thing too, and I'll, I'll just, because I have a tour, I'll just go over it. <laughs> Is, is the level of preparedness that we that we have that we do a lot of research and a lot of analysis it is rare it turns out um, and, and there's something about <laughs> sorry, the, comment, the comment I got and I'll be very specific about this particular this particular job interview the comment I got is that I was very prepared and I went you mean everybody does do this <laughs> um, and the thing is is that we can apply our minds to a range of things so, so including accounting yes it's yep. true. Um, so, so just like the, no no limits on this no limits on the subject matter or the potential for what we can learn and what we can apply. Uh, Sydney and then um, well, I think one of the things that we're that we're skirting around uh, in terms of gender parity certainly has to do with um, responsibilities in the quote unquote domestic sphere mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and and how institutions can support women who are also other people, but certainly, I, I'm, unfortunately, I would say that women still are the go-to caregivers in most American families and probably in many countries around the world. So I know that um, Salisa's theater has done some stuff around adjusting uh, rehearsal schedules and things like that so that they are more accommodating to people who have caregiving roles outside of their life in the theater. Um, and I think that that's something that we really need to think about as a group, not just in, um, you know, in, in institutional theater. We have to think about it in academia as well, because quite frankly, when I had a kid, I realized I couldn't be at work eight hours a day, then go home for an hour, and then go back and direct for another three hours or four hours at night, because I would literally never see 
went to Sydney's point, um, I think all the things that happen around the Alliance Theater being family friendly, which has led to enormous uh, retention at the senior management level of people with profound skills who have kids, uh, men and women, but that's led by our artistic director having a child and um, and not wanting to be one of those parents who sees their kid. Uh, and Second Mom Church was uh, great and we came up with a lot of really practical things that you can ask for that are not um, that are that sometimes people just have a lot of. Yeah. And you've been waiting for a while. Yeah, yeah, you've been the red hair. Hello, hi. hi. I'm Danielle from Australia. I just wanted to offer a little Australian perspective, um, which you can disregard because I know we're talking about America and I don't want to ruin it. That's what we're talking about. And then, yeah. We're talking about the whole world. So, um, in Australia, we have a bit more federal and there's a state government funding for our institutions, and our federal government body, the Australia Council for the Arts and the Women in Theatre Report. And so, when I was talking to some people about this last night, one of the main things they found was that there are, as Jess was saying, a lot of women in the independent sector leading, but it's kind of like a ghetto, and that's part of the problem is that you have a lot of women in the independent sectors, but they're not they're not going up into the you know major performing arts board kind of things. And the other thing was that looking at the number of artistic directors is great, but who are the CEOs? And again, the number of women on board, but who are the chairs on the board? And there are a lot of there is a reasonable parity in Australia on chairs of board. On, Members of boards, but not chairs of boards. The chairs of boards are still often men. And again, women playwrights are often um, always the bridesmaids, never the bride, and they're always in development, but not produced as much as men. Um, but I also just wanted to say, in terms of mentorship, I was really lucky to have some really great female mentors. And one of the things they said to me, which I think is kind of relevant, is that everything I do is because of the person that came before me and for the person that comes after. And I think that's it's kind of relevant. Positions uh, isn't the only way to lead, and I think um, uh, uh, in Canada, anyway, the mythology that leadership or the, our regional theaters are in fact leading the theatrical world is a mythology and it's a dying one. Uh, and so, whether aspiring to those leadership positions, no offense that you yeah, like, but, uh, <laughs> but that leadership can take uh, uh, many other uh, avenues, and the life you lead can be um, the way you lead. Uh, Liz Engelman would be a classic example of that, of leading through um, the life she leads in the theater and beyond. And indeed, Sarah in Canada would be another uh, great example of that, leading through a variety of positions and certainly not, sometimes, but not always at the head of organizations. The um, thing I wanted to ask the, the panel to consider asking, including Vicky, is um, uh, why do you bother? Um, how, where do you weigh the equation of the cost and the reward of leadership? Uh, and the other thing I would ask is, um, uh, what do you look for in uh, identifying leaders that may follow you? Um, because this room, I suspect, is full of those people, and it behooves us who have had the fortune to stand up and take it on, find those people and identify them for all the reasons that
writer, be an editor, be a polymath. And then in the summer go off and dig for fossils out of the way. <laughs> and be whoever that was. And, and that killed effectively being an artistic director. Sure. But that was okay. And, and, I, and it was fine. It was just fine. And, and leadership became another thing for me. And, and it was okay. And, you know, that's why I understand exactly what you're saying. Leadership can take other forms, you know, and you decide that's the person I can wake up to at four in the morning. <laughs> I'm going to let Alana speak, and then I think we have time for just one more from Megan, who had her hand up. I don't want to avoid it. One more from here. Super short answer to Brian to your questions. What do I look for in the leaders of tomorrow? Point of view and voice. Do they use it? Right? And why bother with this at all? Um, because it's a lot about, and what you talked about, um, I don't, I love the theater, and I love the artistry of it. But I'm, I wake up in the morning trying to use it to make the world better. Um, and that's just, that's what I care about, right? So my version of what the better world is means that I can have an impact in that. So that's why I do it. Even though it costs 